Hi, a very good afternoon to all and a very warm welcome to the talk Digital Horizons. Now this is the first talk of C Spotlight, which is a specially curated series of panel discussions and talks that are organized as part of C Focus 2021. Now, before we begin, please be informed that there will be a dedicated time of Q&A towards the end of the discussion. You are very much encouraged to leave comments and questions in the Q&A function of this Zoom webinar, and that is located at the bottom bar of the platform, and you can do this anytime during the talk. Please allow me to quickly introduce and welcome our panelists this afternoon. We have Anlam de Costier, Global Strategic Partnerships Lead at Artsy, Eugene So, who is an artist and founder of Dude and Mind Palace, and art collector Wiyu Wahono. And this panel will be moderated by Nadia Wang, editor of Art and Market. Welcome all of you, and it is a pleasure to have you as part of today's discussion. So I'll now hand the time over to Nadia, who will begin this panel. Over to you, Nadia. Hi, everyone. Thank you for spending the next hour with us. I am looking forward to hearing what our panelists have to say about digital art, as well as the digitizing of the art landscape. The COVID pandemic has accelerated the move of art into hyperspace with more artists producing digital works and as galleries and museums are increasingly putting presentations and collections online as well. In a vast array of digital art, works can range from video to virtual reality and augmented reality, gaming and art transmitted via social media. Even as new opportunities are opening up, there seems to be a displacement of creative labor. What does this mean for art to come? Is there a promising future or will we see a return to the real? So joining me today, as Rachel has introduced, are Wiyu Wahono, Eugene So, and Alam Dacoste. Wiyu is an art collector hailing from Jakarta, Indonesia. His collection has been exhibited widely, including at the Asia Society Museum, New York, and National Gallery, Singapore. He has served on juries for art competitions, such as the Bandung Contemporary Art Award, and he's a member of several boards, such as the Board of Young Collectors at Art Jakarta. Wiyu, welcome. Could you share with us some of the digital artworks in your collection? Yeah. So first of all, I would like to thank Southeast Asia Art Focus for inviting me to be here. Uh, I started collecting paintings and sculpture uh, more than 20 years ago and changed to uh, media art a few years later. There are many reasons actually why I think media art is the art significant for our time. First, uh, more than half of the 7.6 billion world populations were born post-1989. These people, age 32 today and younger, started using the internet very, at a very young age. They are accustomed to rapid changes and they are very comfortable with social media and technology. Yeah. In the very near future, these people will become the defining power in our art world. So I'm very sure they would feel more connected to media art than to paintings and sculptures. Yeah, another reason is, as we all know, the uh, formation of postmodernism originated with the identity politics movement in the end of 60s and 70s, right? And among others. And the identity politics movement came out of the 1960s counterculture, uh, anti-establishment, uh, anti-colonial uh, uh, struggles, and the immense technological advances at that time shown by the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon. So the people back then realized they needed major social, political, technological, and cultural changes. That is the reason why contemporary art was born, right? So the technological changes that happened afterwards, such as the development of industrial new media technologies, brought the media art as the logical consequence. That's why it's very important if we talk about contemporary art that we have to include media art in our collection. 
So there are many more reasons, but I want to share with you the challenges that I enjoy the most in collecting media art. The first slide show my office room. Uh, when I started buying digital moving image or shortly called uh, video art, I realized happily that I could display a video art be beside this big window, shiny windows, without worrying that the color will fade out. Yeah, so if you would hang a photography or uh, I mean a painting, so you can't do that because of the sunshine. Yeah, so on the next piece, after collecting many single channel video art, I fell in love in multi channel uh, artworks. And this eight channel uh, relational aesthetic by the Indonesian artist Tintin Mulia is the maximum number of channels that I have in my collection. And I made the experience with this purchase that besides buying the artwork, I have to spend quite a lot of money to buy eight televisions. Yeah, so uh, it is uh, the experience that I have uh, collecting media art. And next please. One day I was mesmerized by this Venice Biennale 2009 award-winning video art by Singapore artist Ming Wong, which is a two-channel video that has to, be, has to be installed with two big mirrors in the room. With this artwork, I made a new experience that I have to sacrifice one room for one artwork. I mean, for people with big office room, it's not an issue, but for, uh, for me, who have a relatively small office, it is a challenge in terms of the space. Yeah. So the next, please. <clears throat> uh, next artwork. Another challenge when I bought this amazing audio visual installation by Ryoji Ikeda, where uh, this artwork can only run with a very special projector that I don't that I cannot couldn't buy in Indonesia and not in Singapore. So I googled and found this projector in the United States. So I have to import this 30 kilogram heavy projector from the United States with the risk that it get broken during the transportation. And I spent 25,000 alone for the projector, which is necessary because, uh, next please, Ryoji want to show these dots that you can see. So from far away projected the entire wall and it have, you have to see the dots, very sharp dots. So with another projector, it would not be possible. So after that, next please, I still have to have buy a new lens because Ryoji wanted me to have a full wall projection. The entire wall height should be filled with projection. And to get this full height, I need a throw distance from 12 meter with a standard lens. So, distance between wall and projector. And my room is only 10 meter. So I need a new lens. So I Googled and found a lens in France. So I have to import from France. It costs about 8,000 euro. Yeah, just to give you an idea. So what it is. And then <clears throat> I have to buy special speaker from Yamaha. It has to be that Yamaha. He doesn't want me to buy another Yamaha, which is more a better or whatever. So because he wants to have this special sound effect. Ryoji Ikeda is a sound artist. And that's not enough. I still have to pay a uh, written ticket, Tokyo, Jakarta, uh, hotel, accommodation, and meal uh, for a software expert from Japan to come and install. I'm not allowed to install the artwork that I have bought by myself. Yeah. So at that time, I wish he would agree with the Indonesian rupiah salary, but he didn't, of course. So, and yeah, the so next please. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2009, I visited a very amazing exhibition in Mori Museum where I heard the word bio art for the first time. So the artist was Eduardo Kac, from whom I bought this flower later on. It's a real flower, genetically engineered with the DNA from the artist. That's why you see the blood vein 
and the skin color of the artist in this flower. Eduardo is a Brazilian, hence the pink skin color of in this flower. Yeah. <clears throat> and I started to explore, next please, into the bio art and found this amazing artwork by C Lab. And it's 265 glass flasks filled with transparent liquid and bacteria, living bacteria that change the color according to the image captured by the CCTV camera. So the lady is moving in front of this artwork and she will look, I mean, in real time, her own image, just like a mirror produced by the bacteria. So the bacteria change color according to the signal uh, captured by the camera. And because it is a living organism, all 600, uh, 265 bottles has to be cleaned uh, twice or once a year. And it takes me always two days with two people to open thousands of small screws, tiny screws, take out the bottle and clean the bottle inside and then fill it back and then run the artworks. It's a challenge in terms of the maintenance. So there are a lot of more challenges uh, in collecting uh, media, but uh, I think uh, for people, especially uh, who are into the commercial value, <clears throat> I think they should not buy the uh, media. There is a market yet. Yeah, maybe Alam can. Uh, talk about it later. So these ever growing challenges are among others the reasons why today I find photography on video art not very exciting anymore. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much, Ryu. That was a treat to see all the work that you have in your collection and also to hear about the considerations that go into acquiring these artworks and taking care of them. We'll get back to that later in the discussion. For now, I'd like to introduce Eugene So, who is a tech artist and founder of Dude Studios, a creative tech studio focusing on virtual reality or VR and augmented reality AR and Mind Palace, a social enterprise that uses VR to help dementia patients and nursing home residents revisit fond places and explore the world from the comfort and safety of their chairs, keeping our minds active and slowing the effects of dementia. Eugene, hi, could you share with us some of your projects? Oh yes, uh, hello everybody. So I'm Eugene, so I'm a tech artist and I run these two companies. Uh, so go to the next slide. So uh, who, uh, who is Dude? Dude, we are a small studio of four people, including me. So we currently do a lot of uh, AR stuff, which is Instagram filters. Instagram filters are, is AR and uh, in, interactive installations and websites for people. So, and we are also uh, the official Facebook Spark AR partners, which is, um, yeah, like we are officially recognized as the best in the world in doing this in this stuff. So the next slide. So these are like the examples of recent works. You can hey, are these videos? Uh, these are videos, right? Can we? Can you play them? Play the the. Let's see. Yeah, that one can that one be played? Oh, it can't be played. Or maybe I can share screen. Maybe you can let me share screen. Then I can go and play them. Okay, can y'all see my screen? Can okay, right? Yeah. So so this this one on the left here, that's for Lego, which is uh so this is what I meant by filters. So they are Little 3D objects that, that go on uh, that make people look cuter. This 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 one here abducts people and there's a UFO that comes in and then abducts people. 
And we managed, managed to squeeze 10, 10 different filters into one. This one was done for Lego for the beginning of the year. The one on the right, right here is done for JD, JD Sports in London. Then the currently I'm showing this one, my fourth solo show at the in front of Mandarin Gallery, in front of this container uh, is in these containers. I'm showing two two filters. So essentially people go go there and they will experience the filter in real life, which is quite interesting to me because uh, these filters, they generally exist in the digital world only. And then um, putting putting them in to like a gallery context, then you just now we you was talking about buying the televisions. Oh, whoops. Buying the televisions and everything. So we we had to rent the tele the television screens and the webcams and the computers to set this all up. So this is yeah, to me it, it is very interesting because these filters are something that was made on the internet for the internet, but when it comes to exhibiting it in real life, we are suddenly kind of converting it into something physical. You were taking it out of its uh, natural habitat. And then uh, Mind Palace, uh, to, to talk a little bit about it is we, we do virtual reality for the elderly. You, you, don't, you guys don't hear the audio from the, you guys don't hear the audio from the video, right? A little. You can hear it, yeah? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so what we do is for, for this video in particular, we let them, because we found that virtual reality is only, is only a uh, sight and sound. It's only, or it's only when you put on the goggles, right? You can only see and hear, but we thought when you put, when you mix it with food. So in this experience, we got our, uh, let me just mute the, okay. Just, uh, we thought that, mixing food with virtual reality will enhance the experience for, especially for people living with dementia. They, they, need, they need this kind of memorable experiences. So when, when during my, my trials with, with, with them, we found that may, virtual reality is memorable, but sometime, somehow they still forget the experience the next, the next time around. But with food, we work with a uh, Hawker Chan, our Michelin star, uh, chicken rice man, the do you all know Hawker Chan? He is the he is I think he has a Michelin star and he run he started running like street uh, street chicken rice stores, but now he is like a global franchise really. He has he has uh established himself uh in a few countries. And then so we got him to cook his signature chicken rice and uh in and addressing the the VR camera like he was addressing the aunties and uncles living in the nursing home. And then when the aunties and uncles are watching the, are watching the show, they will, they will then smell and they will smell the chicken rice also while they are watching him cook the chicken rice, but they don't know why they can smell it. They, they think that it might be because uh, the technology is so good, but it's actually because Hawker Chan uh, would graciously sponsor these sessions with, 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 like 100 packs of chicken rice, then I will be bringing the chicken rice into the nursing home first and then we hide it in one room. Then when the, when the elderly, they are, they are in the experience watching, the, watching Hawker Chan cook his chicken rice, we will sneak it out in front of them and then they can smell it. Then after the experience, they take it out. Uh, the plate of chicken rice is in front of them. So, it's as, so it, it feels as if Hawker Chan has personally cooked it for them. And then we found that the results of this uh, of these sessions is that they we found that it was more memorable. The next time I go back, they would ask me, "Hey, uh, is there chicken rice today?" Instead of looking at me like as if they have never met me be before. So I think this is an improvement in terms of their memory. So on the this picture on the on, on the right here is our later latest project where we instead of using the virtual reality cameras, uh, virtual reality headsets, we have turned an entire room into, into uh, an immersive room. So 
I think just now we were showing his projection of the numbers on that one wall, ceiling, floor to ceiling kind of projections. We have made that kind of projection uh, on, on all the walls inside the room. So, so it's completely immersed. So over here in this picture, you can only see two walls, but this entire room has uh, been filled with the short throw projectors. I think probably it doesn't cost too much these days, not, not as much as uh, Wii U uh, paid. I think these days, one of these projectors, short throw projectors that can, that can uh, project huge, uh, it's about 3,000 3, Singapore dollars, 3,000 Singapore dollars. So that is about 1,000 something US dollars. Uh, probably this, this might be a new thing uh, in terms of the projection technology. So currently we also have one more show at, uh, that's opening tonight at Gilman Barracks where we also made a cave like that uh, for people to experience um, this Hong Kong artists and Singapore artists colla uh, collaborating to put together a show. Uh, so we initially created that, that cave because we thought that, okay, we probably cannot have a full on show and we wanted people to uh, at least experience the cave vir uh, virtually or physically. Uh, but it turns out that we that COVID situation has improved a lot. So now we are having the whole show, and also we are we are also going to have the the virtual reality cave where people can experience. So people can experience the the artworks in two versions at the opening tonight at Gilman Barracks. So thank you very much. I shall pass the stop sharing. Thanks, Eugene. That was amazing. I mean, the experiences that you can offer through VR and AR, we'll get back to that as well. Last but not least, I'd like to welcome Anlam De Coste, who leads Artsy's Global Strategic Partnerships. She advises art fairs and gallery weekends on their digital transformation and connecting them with new audiences around the world. Alam has 15 years of experience in arts management, cultural policy and marketing communications, working with museums, art fairs, galleries, auction houses and festivals. Alam, could you talk us through what you have been working on with your team? Well, thank you so much, Nadia. And thank you, C Focus, uh, for inviting me to join this panel with uh, wonderful participants. And uh, we're delighted to partner with the third edition of Sea Focus, uh, the leading fair in Southeast Asia. And today I will be sharing with you a brief overview of the trends we have been observing on our platform that can inform our future predictions for the art market. Next slide, please. For those of you who are not familiar with Artsy, we are the world's leading online marketplace for buying and selling fine art. Our platform allows collectors to discover and purchase artworks they love and provides sellers access to our global collector base. Our mission at Artsy is to expand the art market to support more artists and art around the world. It's what we live for. Next slide, please. So as many of you know, the art world today as it as stands is not reaching its full potential. And the clearest indication is this, 98% um, of luxury consumers today do not buy art. As you know, we all experience galleries and auction houses are intimidating, prices are usually not available and transactions are also quite antiquated. Next slide, please. And at Artsy, we are working to change that. We're building a digital first art platform that is inclusive, transparent, and prosperous for everyone. And here's how we do it. First of all, we are aggregating all of the world's art on one platform by partnering with galleries, auction houses, fairs, and collectors. We're increasing the amount of information made available about that art, and we include prices. And we're introducing uh, trusted and safe ways to buy art online. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And, um, you know, the pandemic has been um, completely disrupting our lives in all its aspects, but it also dramatically accelerated the industry's shift online, laying the foundations for a more, hopefully, open art world. 
collectors looked for new ways to connect with the art world from the safety of their homes. And they overwhelmingly turned to art themes. In total, today, more than 2 million art lovers have become RT users, and our app has been downloaded over 1 million times. And an interesting fact is the fact that um, 50%, almost 50% of our traffic and commercial engagement comes from the app. So the world is indeed changing. Next slide, please. While the physical world shut down, the number of online sales increased dramatically this year, providing a lifeline for many struggling businesses in the art world. And in 2020, the average artsy partners saw a 40% increase in commercial activity and a 170% increase in buy now and make offer transactions, which happened directly on platform. I mean, you can see here, all metrics are up and, um, and this has been, you know, uh, a wonderful experience to be able to support uh, our partners um, in the art world when um, their galleries, fairs, um, auction houses um, were inaccessible to the public. Next slide, please. And despite everything, collector demand has held strong. I think we, yes. And um, I think it is really fascinating to see that 60% uh, of collectors report being more interested in buying art now than pre-COVID. And 50% more collectors bought art online overall, including more millennials, twice as many new collectors. Um, and we see a continuous growth across the globe. It's not only you know, a certain region, it is really a global movement uh, for um, new uh, collectors joining the art market, but also existing collectors now uh, engaging with digital um, ways of buying art. Next slide, please. And by partnering with Artsy, a gallery, fair, or an auction can become a digital business overnight, meeting existing demand and tapping into the next generation of collectors. Because we provide a global network of digital first art enthusiasts and a technology that powers personalized recommendations matching artworks to collectors. And we expect continued growth in the buying on selling arts online now that behavior has entirely shifted as we have seen in other industries. Next slide, please. And as uh, we're talking, um, you know, on the occasion of Seed Focus, I wanted to mention that, you know, this year has been particularly difficult for art fairs. And we were uh, lucky to be able to support 67 art fairs and gallery weekends, including 20 exclusively online editions, helping to keep them and their galleries afloat. And we generated, you know, a really stunning number of page views and inquiries for these uh, partners. And this is the year that the art world became digital first. And we're honored to have kept collectors connected to the artworks and fairs that nourish them and in turn nourish us because I think we all realize how much we need art um, as you know we were confined to this really flat um, boring new world. Next slide please. And um, I wanted to before we open the conversation up I wanted to share a few highlights from the um, Artsy's Galleries Insights report that we have just recently released and you can download it um, from the RT website. We conducted a survey with over 1,700 artworks professionals from 97 countries. And the results are really, really you know, eye-opening and it can really inform our future predictions. And I wanted to focus on a few key findings. Um, first of all, 35% of respondents respondents reported operating without a physical location. This is more than double the numbers reported in the last two years. It is you know, an incredible shift. In the past, it was not conceivable for a gallery to not to have a physical location. They would not be allowed to you know, apply for art fairs. This is a massive shift. 
The second is uh, price transparency. And I think, uh, next slide, please. I think we can all agree that it's probably one of the best things that happened to the art world, thanks to the online viewing rooms and you know the um, different ways of sh sharing information with collectors and the wider audiences. Um, we see that on Artsy, um, works with visible pricing are four to six times more likely to sell. So, and, and I think um, in all segments of the art world, now we're embracing price transparency, which is, I think, fantastic for opening it up to new collectors. And a third important finding I wanted to share is that um, the way galleries are reaching collectors and making sales has been, you know, tremendously, um, you know, different in 2020. When you compare, um, you know, the top uh, seven ways of uh, selling works to collectors uh, from 2019 to 2020. I think the number one is, um, you know, uh, clearly outreach uh, to existing clients. But when you look at the following items, it's, you know, the walk-ins uh, from your physical space was replaced by the gallery website and art fairs surprisingly was replaced by social media. And of course, this is um, not um, kind of um, the exact uh, percentage uh, across the world because um, in Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East, social media is the second most successful platform for sales. In Europe, it is the third more successful. North America, Asia, and Oceania, it doesn't even make it to the top three. So, um, you know, take it with a grain of salt because, um, you know, in some regions, social media is more prominent, but still I think this shift is, is huge. And, um, and of course, you know, online marketplaces uh, are here to stay. And um, next slide, please. This also has um, impacted, um, the kind of marketing budgets and tactics of uh, of galleries, and you can see here on this chart how their year-on-year -year, uh, budgets um, were impacted uh, by the pandemic, and how uh, although they spend much less in fairs, it's still the number one budget item, um, but they now spend a huge amount of energy towards their digital strategy, uh, which seems to pay off because some galleries report that 2020 was their best year ever, you know, against all odds, because they really reduced uh, fair expenses, VIP event expenses, and they can really leverage uh, their existing client base and reach new collectors through social media, digital strategies, you know, uh, online walkthroughs, etc. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to finish off by saying that. Um, we see this huge untapped potential for the art world. And um, there's a new generation of collectors who are joining um, this, this world. And 73% um, of the galleries reported that at least half of the collectors they connected with online in 2020 were new to their business. And the numbers of buyers between the ages of 18 and 35 doubled. So um, this is, I think, huge for, you know, when we envision the future of our uh, of our ecosystem, and we see that uh, online is not only a successful strategy during a time of pandemic, um, but it is also a trend that will continue into the future. And we can really um, make sure that we expand the art market uh, by you know opening it up to larger audiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anlam, for sharing all of those very interesting statistics. Um, I thought we would just start the conversation by going back to Liu and asking him as an art collector whether Liu, you have been purchasing any artworks online in the past year. Yeah, I started buying uh, in an online auction a mm -hmm. long time ago uh, because of my curiosity, actually. I wanted to know how it is still like to buy in an online auction. Does it make any difference in the joy of collecting art 
Uh, I got my Shirin Nassar at that time. So it was a good purchase in terms of price. And uh, I was very happy, yeah. But the experience online, so I mean, appreciating an online for me is not new. So I think for all, a lot of friends of mine in Asia who bought artworks from galleries in United States or in, uh, in Europe, they just got the PDF file and then they have to decide whether to buy or not. So, uh, but due to the pandemic, so uh, the online viewing room has become nicer and more enjoyable than looking at the PDF, right? Especially uh, the Art Basel one. I find it amazing because they just put a, a chair in front of the artworks and then you get the relationship between the size of the artwork and the chair, right? Instead of online viewing room without any uh, relational objects, so you don't know, you have to look at it, how many centimeters it is, how big is the painting. So you just put a chair and then you you know, uh -huh, this is a small one and this is a big one. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, on the topic of online viewing rooms, what do you look for exactly in it? Because, you know, I'm also hearing people say that sometimes it feels a bit cold because there aren't people in it, right? So you're sort of like on your own walking through, what do you think about it? Will you all, Eugene, Anlam, please feel free to jump in as well. So, I mean, uh, for me personally, uh, anyway, I, I, I don't like to talk so much in the art fair. If I am looking at the at an artwork, right? I, I talked several times already about it. If I see an artwork and I'm very concentrated in uh, analyzing whether this artwork uh, represent the spirit of our time, is it a significant artwork for 21st century? And then the second question, a major question for me is, does this artwork coherent to my existing collection? I don't want to have a, an anthological collection. I mean, but coherency, uh, coherence is a very important issue in building a strong collection, I think. So that's why, while analyzing these issues, yeah, and a lot of galleries just disturbing me, right? They always tell me about, uh, oh, we you this artist, uh, we'll have an exhibition in the National Gallery, and then we'll uh, uh, graduated from a very good school, right? And this and that school. That's not important for me because, I mean, the message, the message of telling me that he is from a good school and he will have a good exhibition in a museum, the, the message is, the price will go up, right? That is what they want to tell me. I'm not interested in that, right? For, for collector who collect media art with no market, every, every dollar I spend is yeah, probably wasting money. I cannot sell it anymore, right? Who gonna buy my, my living bacteria in the bottles, right? So, uh, I only focus of will this artwork make my collection stronger? And then she always is the crumb. You know, if you eat the bread, then you get the crumb always, yeah? So, uh, and yeah, and that's uh, my experience. So uh, looking at the online viewing room is great. I have the freedom to look, it, to look at it in the, at midnight, doesn't disturb my uh, business activity. Right, and if I'm, I get bored, I just switch off and then I continue later. Amazing, it's good, yeah. Sounds like it's perfect for how you like to look at art and decide on what to put in your collection. What about for you, Alam and Eugene, how do you work on creating that best digital experience for you know, your audiences? Because I think that's one of the biggest questions we have, like moving from the physical to the digital, how do you translate the experience or how do you create an entirely new experience, you know, that will still draw people in? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, actually, this is what we're working on at Artsy because, you know, creating a physical art experience is not the same. I mean, you cannot just put the content online and expect collectors to engage with it in the same way. So you really need to think about human behavior, psychology, and the best digital tools we have. And in line with what VU was saying, for instance, 
for me, um, one of the biggest um, tools I use for collecting this year was the augmented reality that we have on the RT app because it really gives you the possibility of virtually hanging the work on your own wall and projecting it into your own space and have like almost a physical experience with the work. And when we uh, design our interface, we always try to think of, you know, how the collector kind of browses uh, online and how they can best find the works that might be suited for their taste. So one part of this um, equation is our personalized recommendations because we have an algorithm similar to, you know, Spotify that increases your chances of being matched with the artworks you would love. So for discovery, it's fantastic. And the second, I think, important piece of that puzzle is uh, art filtering mechanisms. Like when you visit an art fair, you're usually completely overwhelmed and exhausted. You have thousands and thousands of artworks, your friends, conversations, champagne, you know, things that are distracting you. So you always maybe engage with 1% of what is on display. Um, and then, you know, you move on to your life, you forget about what happened and you took some pictures, you don't even have a reference of where the picture was from. You know, so it's not a very efficient experience, but when you browse an art fair online, for instance, as Vivi was saying, you're not distracted, but you also have the tools to search for specific things. Like if you're collecting, you know, uh, media arts, you can really look at that. If you have a specific budget, you can really filter by that. If you're looking at, you know, um, um, you know, different mediums, you can really have a personalized experience and you can see the full picture. So that's uh, what I, why I, I really love um, being able to uh, buy art online and being able to, of course, be connected with people around the world is, is fantastic. Thank you, Anlam. What about for you, Eugene? How do you create that immersive experience for your audience? Uh, so I, in 2013, I made an online gallery where I was trying to recreate the physical, the physical experience of visiting a gallery in, in virtual space. So I made a multiplayer first person shooter kind of thing where someone to, were to go on to the website gallery.sg they will see someone else there. But now hearing Wii U, what Wii U is saying, he would rather not have the other people there, which is actually in line with what I learned from that uh, 2013 uh, gallery that I made. So instead of trying to recreate the physical experience, we should play up the advantages of uh, the digital space where uh, there were some examples like in the 3D space, you had to walk around the place to look at different kinds of uh, art. And then if there was a 3D wall in front of you, you, it would be blocking you. So you would have to navigate around that. So in the end, uh, what I learned from that is uh, to probably just do away with that. And also to talk to people, you had to um, be near, near them in the virtual space and then they, you can hear them talking with their mic. So instead of doing that, uh, we can do what Zoom is doing now. Uh, whoever is talking, you can, do, uh, you can hear it without, without that, trying to recreate the whole physical thing. So um, years later, seven, uh, eight years later, we have mo moved on to doing online experiences like the one that is opening tonight. It, it was, they were also cautious enough to make, uh, make an online experience. So they commissioned us uh, at Dude to make it. I can, it is, the online one is still not launched yet, but you can have a secret peek at it. It is almost done. It's almost done. Just some, uh, just some uh, minor, minor things. You can go check it out at your own leisure later on. Thank you so much, Anlam and Eugene. I'm just wondering, I mean, all three of you have been involved with the digital like way before everyone had to do it. I'm just wondering whether the pandemic did still, you know, push you to innovate or, you know, push you to acquire skills that you didn't have before. Yeah, um, this, this link that I just pasted in the chat is one example of a uh, because of the pandemic, then we, we, we had to do it. Uh, we had to do it and it is still in progress now. I mean, yeah, it's still very fresh from the pandemic. 
What about for your Anlam with, you know, the, the platform? I mean, you were already a digital platform and you were already pushing galleries, art fairs to go online with you guys. Um, but how did it help you or push you to innovate further? Of course. Thank you, Nadia. We have hosted uh, over 500 online fairs uh, since 2012 on Artsy. So we have been in this, you know, uh, for the, you know, for a long time indeed. But um, seeing this demand from the collectors and from our partners, we work to um, refresh our fair surface. And also we invested heavily in our app uh, to you know, keep up with the demands of uh, this transformation. So we are constantly looking at ways of improving our platform, our relationship with our partners and the experience we offer to collectors. Because exactly like Eugene was saying, and the answer is not to try to replicate the physical experience online, but come up with completely new ways of, you know, um, exploring and, um, you know, uh, experiencing artworks. And this is what we have been working on. And our strategy this year is really putting mobile first. And for me, you know, coming from the more traditional art world, it has been a scary experience because, you know, like what experiencing artworks on this tiny screen? Um, but, um, you know, we also adapt our um, kind of way of thinking to developments that are, you know, society-wide. Oh, yes. I forgot to mention also, we, uh, for last year, 2020, we made an online exhibition on Instagram as, a, as an Instagram filter. So you can, you can, the filter opens up this museum where you can click around to navigate the space and look at the artwork by using your phone to look around. This one is on complex.com's um, Instagram page. You can go check it out. It is a meme museum. It is a museum of memes to describe 2020. Yeah, it's still showing now. You can go check it out. Thank you for that. I like that name, Meme Museum. That's really cool. Um, I wanted to go back to Ryu and talk to you about a project I know you're a part of. Um, this is Art Outreach's fourth in part collector's show titled Leap of Faith. Because um, I thought that it was really clever of Art Outreach to, you know, put these videos together of collectors in their home and to show off their collections um, for everyone to enjoy. And in particular, I was talking to Eve Hoon, who is the head of special projects at Art Outreach, and she said something about um, the work Zero Degree by Danny Ramdani that kind of prompted the whole idea. Could you talk more about this view? Yeah. Uh, I'm very glad that they invite me to take part in the collector show where I can uh, display or show uh, huge artworks. It's a plastic bag filled with water and uh, living fish inside, a lot of fish inside. And the plastic bag uh, has leakage on the bottom. So people will look at the plastic bag and get scared that the fish will die very soon because the water is dropping out, right? So this, uh, yeah, this, this feeling of dying is a metaphor for what is happening worldwide uh, in the urban city. The issue, the context of this artwork is about uh, urbanization. Yeah, we live in a huge city, we have more than 10 million uh, population, and if we don't take care of our environment, uh, yeah, that will be a serious problem for all of us. That's why, that's the reason why I bought this artwork. It's perfect because it is very difficult to uh, have an exhibition outside my art space for this artwork, right? So this artwork needs uh, water drainage, of course, on the bottom. And uh, there, there is a pump because the, the back is constantly filled with water again so that the fish will not die. But I mean, fewer cannot see where the water comes in. And, and the hole is not at the bottom. A lot of people see it and think like, oh, the wall is on the bottom. I mean, the hole is on the side. So after the water drops to a certain level, there will no, no drop anymore. But the fish will still die in the plastic bag after one week. So uh, it's very difficult to have this artwork in my space. So that me means 
if I get a, a visitor coming to my space and then I fill the water and the fish. And after they left, I have to empty the bag, right? So uh, it's, it's a challenge to, to have this kind of artwork in my collection, but I love the context and it's coherent to my entire collection. And it's very nice that people get uh, confused that I have uh, yeah, living fishes as artworks in my collection. This is what I love. Yeah, I think this is really interesting to look at because, you know, um, he was talking about how in a normal show, you would have to ship this work to the premise, but of course that would be really difficult. So it was perfect that it became like a digital showcase. So you could show off this physical work um, to a bigger audience. I think now we can kind of weave in questions from the audience as well. We have quite a number. Um, I will keep you on here with you with a question from Christoph Noor from um, Larry's List. He's asking about how, you know, according to their research on collectors under 40, uh, it seems that oil on canvas still seems to be the preferred medium for collecting. Do you think this will continue to be the case? Because you're also talking about how there are a lot of considerations, it's a commitment to take care of digital works. What do you have to say about that? Yeah. So I think uh, painting and sculpture will be uh, will exist still as they will fulfill the need of the majority of the collectors yeah i also experienced let's say the, uh, video art so if you go to an art space or a, a, a show uh, in a museum and then you look at the painting and then you have a full control how long you want to stay and enjoy the artwork and then you can move on Right? If you don't like it, you just move on. If you like it, you stay longer. And then I experience, you can experience also yourself. You go into the dark room and see a video art, right? The first feeling everybody gets is, I have to see it from the beginning, right? But the movie, I mean, the video art is ongoing. So you cannot see it from the beginning. And then after two minutes, usually, and then you said, I have to go because there are not a lot of artworks to see. You don't have the time to sit for half an hour or one hour. And then you stand up. And in the moment you go out from the room, you get frustrated because you have the feeling that you don't understand the video art yet. Right? I think that this frustration that you don't understand it yet and you haven't seen it from the beginning and so on, this negative feeling will make video art always to be a uh, captive market, yeah, will we'll get, I mean, it will be very, very, very difficult to be appreciated by from collectors. Just an example from the video art, yeah. So, but other artworks like technological-based art, laser and uh, sound art and everything, uh, the situation is better. Thank you, Wiyu. Um, we have another question that's for Anla, but I think we can all try to answer this. This is from Mistiko Rahadi. Um, he's asking, some of the artworks need to be experienced in person for that immersive experience, or even just to feel you know, that, that tactility, I guess, right? That um, in the presence of an artwork. How does Artsy tackle this problem? I think Artsy cannot tackle all problems of the art world at once, and I think, I certainly believe in a world that we need to continue to go to museums, to galleries, to art fairs. We need to continue to experience artworks in person, absolutely. But at the same time, you know, I'm coming from Turkey and I grew up in a country where we didn't have any contemporary art museums as I grew up. I didn't have access to what was happening in New York, in London, in Singapore. Artsy does open it up to audiences to be able to at least be informed be able to acquire these works or even for curators to do their research, but it cannot replace all aspects of the art world. Of course, we will need to continue to, you know, physically experience uh, artworks. And I think context is hugely important. Um, so we need to be able to, you know, uh, hear it from the artists, from the curators, from the gallery owners, um, but Artsy uh, is helping that physical components with opening access to global audiences and facilitating the transactions, you know, the, you know, the um, kind of market uh, piece of the puzzle. 
Yes, definitely. I think Eugene, through your artworks, like with Art Encounters, Altered State, we can also see that even though it's something that's experienced digitally, but it's still in a physical space and it's still about getting out there and experiencing in person. What, what do you think about that, Eugene? About yeah, the um, between the physical and digital? Yeah. What Alam said also, Alam said also uh, digital cannot fully replace the, the physical. We had another discussion a few days back, at, uh, also a panel discussion about whether we need to travel. And, and I think there are, there are many advantages of traveling, like we get to meet the people, we get to increase. Uh, there is this, the face-to-face -face is still, still establishes a deeper connection. Although maybe in the future when nobody can meet face-to-face, -face, what if touch wood, uh, if nobody can meet face to face, that could be the the new standard. That could be be the new standard. But for now, um, nothing beats the uh, the face to face. Yeah, it sounds like everyone is saying it's sort of a sell for now. When we can't travel, we can't see um, and travel as we'd like to. But uh, eventually, do you think it will be more complementary than something that takes over the real? What do you guys think? Maybe Anlam, you would like to answer that? I think um, there are two different things. One is um, the market side, um, being able to buy artworks. And I think in that regard, the online art market will continue to grow uh, no matter what. Even if you go back to the you know, physical events, the uh, possibility of buying art online will continue to grow. Uh, through, you know, online viewing rooms, through uh, artsy, through PDFs. I think that is, um, you know, that uh, is just now the reality. Um, but then at the same time, um, for, you know, uh, the art world is not only about the art markets and those physical experiences will always remain uh, crucial. So I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I think they will continue to grow hand in hand. Um, and I think there will be a, a bigger appetite for these in-person experiences when hopefully we see the end of this pandemic, but it will not mean that online art sales will drop. And I think it will only mean that online art sales will continue to grow because even when you visit a physical fair, you need these digital tools to optimize your experience, to be able to save works, for instance, uh, from the fair on your Artsy app, be able to continue to conversation uh, on your phone. Uh, I think you still will need these digital tools um, to improve your physical experience. May I add something, Nadia? Yes, of so, course. So, uh, I mean, uh, digitally, we cannot appreciate uh, interactive artworks, right? And so we can forget. And installation which require a sensory experience because installation has to be you go inside into the art world and enjoy from inside out yeah so that installation and uh, yeah and interactive art world cannot do it without pressing yeah. so i would i would like to add maybe uh, to my answers to Christoph, who asked me about the future. So I'm thinking, always thinking about, uh, if I would be a collector living in the uh, 1930s, yeah, and I, I rely on the theory of Walter Benjamin, so I would buy definitely a repro reproduction artwork, uh, photography at that time, right? From a man ray, let's say, from Lassu Mahali Notch, and my collection would be museum quality today. If I would live in the 1960s, I would rely my collection on influential guy named Marshall McLuhan. I would definitely buy artworks from uh, Bob Vossel, Sun in Your Head, 1963, or Nam Jun Right, because of the electronic media, right? So my collection would be museum quality today as a collector. And I'm thinking of now I'm living in the end of 20th century and, and beginning of 21st century. Whom should I rely to? And I think Jean Boudia will be the one 
about the reality, hyper-reality. That's why what Eugene saw do, does at the moment is highly interesting. Yeah, we, have, we have lost our ability to differentiate between reality and fiction, right? And this is the exciting. This is the art of the future. But a lot of people buy artworks not to capture the spirit of the time, to, to have a great collection, but a lot of them wants to make money or profit. They are proud to be collector buying for 100,000 and then later themselves for 300. They, they feel validated by the price of the artwork. But yeah, for people who really focus on intrinsic quality of the artworks, I think we have to rely on art theory, like John Bouddha, like Marsha Matuan, and like Walter Benjamin, who are, where they are, right? So I think it's very important. Uh, yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Ryu. On that note, I think we can safely conclude that art is very important to all of us, not only as producers, but also as people who appreciate um, the form and that the digital is you know, essential, has become an integral part of how we do our work and how we appreciate art as well. Thank you so much to all of you, Ryu, Eugene, Anlam, for being with me this afternoon. And thank you to the audience as well for staying with us. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you again, Anlam, Eugene, Wiyu, and Nadia for your time and discussion today. So just quickly letting everybody know that, you know, coming up next in our Sea Spotlights talk series today is Bye Bye Biennial, and it's taking place at 6 p.m. this evening. Um, and it's a talk that is actually co-presented with Freeze Magazine. It features speakers Apanam Poshyananda, Reem Shadid, and Natasha Jinwala, and it's moderated by the deputy editor of Freeze Magazine, Amy Sherlock. So for more information and updates on our talks and on C-Focus, please visit our website, cfocus.sg, and also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Once again, thank you all. Um, take care and have a wonderful day ahead. <laughs>